Sketches by Boz Part 2 Scenes Chapter 1 The Streets Morning The appearance presented by the streets of London an hour before sunrise on a summer's morning is most striking even to the few whose unfortunate pursuits of pleasure, or scarcely less unfortunate pursuits of business, cause them to be well acquainted with the scene. There is an air of cold, solitary desolation about the noiseless streets, which we are accustomed to see thronged at other times by a busy, eager crowd, and over the quiet, closely shut buildings, which throughout the day are swarming with life and bustle, that is very impressive. The last drunken man, who shall find his way home before sunlight, has just staggered heavily along, roaring out the burden of the drinking song of the previous night. The last houseless vagrant, whom penury and police have left in the streets, has coiled up his chilly limbs in some paved corner to dream of food and warmth. The drunken, the dissipated, and the wretched have disappeared. The more sober and orderly part of the population have not yet awakened to the labors of the day, and the stillness of death is over the streets. Its very hue seems to be imparted to them, cold and lifeless as they look in the gray, somber light of daybreak. The coach stands in the larger thoroughfares are deserted, the night houses are closed, and the chosen promenades of profligate misery are empty. An occasional policeman may alone be seen at the street corners, listlessly gazing on the deserted prospect before him. And now and then a rakish-looking cat runs stealthily across the road and descends his own area with as much caution and slyness, bounding first on the water butt, then on the dust hole, and then alighting on the flagstones, as if he were conscious that his character depended on his gallantry of the preceding night escaping public observation. A partially opened bedroom window here and there bespeaks the heat of the weather and the uneasy slumbers of its occupant. In the dim, scanty flicker of the rushlight through the window blind denotes the chamber of watching or sickness. With these few exceptions, the streets present no signs of life, nor the houses of habitation. An hour wears away. The spires of the churches and roofs of the principal buildings are faintly tinged with the light of the rising sun, and the streets, by almost imperceptible degrees, begin to resume their bustle and animation. Market carts roll slowly along, the sleepy wagoner impatiently urging on his tired horses, or vainly endeavoring to awaken the boy, who, luxuriously stretched on the top of the fruit baskets, forgets, in happy oblivion, his long-cherished curiosity to behold the wonders of London. Rough, sleepy-looking animals of strange appearance, something between ostlers and hackney coachmen, begin to take down the shutters of early public houses, and little deal tables with the ordinary preparations for a street breakfast make their appearance at the customary stations. Numbers of men and women, principally the latter, carry upon their heads heavy baskets of fruit, toil down the park side of Piccadilly on their way to Convent Garden, and following each other in rapid succession, form a long straggling line from thence to the turn of the road at Knightsbridge. Here and there, a bricklayer's laborer, with the day's dinner tied up in a handkerchief, walks briskly to his work, and occasionally a little knot of three or four schoolboys on a stolen bathing expedition rattle merrily over the pavement, their boisterous mirth contrasting forcibly with the demeanor of the little sweep who, having knocked and rung till his arm aches, and being interdicted by a merciful legislature from endangering his lungs by calling out, sits patiently down on the doorstep until the housemaid may happen to awake. Convent Garden Market and the avenues leading to it are thronged with carts of all sorts, sizes, and descriptions, from the heavy lumbering wagon with its four stout horses to the jingling costermonger's cart, with its consumptive donkey. The pavement is already strewed with decayed cabbage leaves, broken hay bands, and all the indescribable litter of a vegetable market. Men are shouting, carts backing, horses neighing, boys fighting, basket women talking, piemen expatiating on the excellence of their pastry, and donkeys braying. 
These and a hundred other sounds form a compound discordant enough to a Londoner's ears, and remarkably disagreeable to those of country gentlemen who are sleeping at the hummums for the first time. Another hour passes away, and the day begins in good earnest. The servant of all work, who, under the plea of sleeping very soundly, has utterly disregarded Mrs.'s ring for half an hour previously, is warned by Master, whom Mrs. has sent up in his drapery to the landing place for that purpose, that it's half past six, whereupon she wakens all of a sudden with well-feigned astonishment, and goes downstairs very sulkily, wishing, while she strikes a light, that the principle of spontaneous combustion would extend itself to coals and kitchen range. When the fire is lighted, she opens the street door to take in the milk, when, by the most singular coincidence in the world, she discovers that the servant next door has just taken in her milk too, and that Mr. Todd's young man over the way is, by an equally extraordinary chance, taking down his master's shutters. The inevitable consequence is that she just steps, milk jug in hand, as far as next door, just to say good morning to Betsy Clark, and that Mr. Todd's young man just steps over the way to say good morning to both of them. And as the aforesaid Mr. Todd's young man is almost as good-looking and fascinating as the baker himself, the conversation quickly becomes very interesting, and probably would become more so if Betsy Clark's missus, who always will be a following her about, didn't give an angry tap at her bedroom window, on which Mr. Todd's young man tries to whistle coolly as he goes back to his shop much faster than he came from it, and the two girls run back to their respective places, and shut their street doors with surprising softness, each of them poking their heads out of the front parlor window, a minute afterwards, however, ostensibly with a view of looking at the mail, which just then passes by, but really for the purpose of catching another glimpse of Mr. Todd's young man, who, being fond of males, but more of females, takes a short look at the males and a long look at the girls, much to the satisfaction of all parties concerned. The mail itself goes on to the coach office in due course, and the passengers who are going out by the early coach stare with astonishment at the passengers who are coming in by the early coach, who look blue and dismal, and are evidently under the influence of that odd feeling produced by traveling, which makes the events of yesterday morning seem as if they happened at least six months ago, and induces people to wonder with considerable gravity whether the friends and relations they took leave of a fortnight before have altered much since they have left them. The coach office is all alive, and the coaches which are just going out are surrounded by the usual crowd of Jews and nondescripts, who seem to consider, heaven knows why, that it is quite impossible any man can mount a coach without requiring at least six pennyworth of oranges, a penknife, a pocketbook, a last year's annual, a pencil case, a piece of sponge, and a small series of caricatures. Half an hour more, and the sun darts his bright rays cheerfully down the still half-empty streets, and shines with a sufficient force to rouse the dismal laziness of the apprentice, who pauses every other minute from his task of sweeping out the shop and watering the pavement in front of it, to tell another apprentice similarly employed how hot it will be today, or to stand with his right hand shading his eyes and his left resting on the broom, gazing at the Wonder, or the Tally-Ho, or the Nimrod, or some other fast coach, till it is out of sight, when he re-enters the shop, envying the passengers on the outside of the fast coach, and thinking of the old red brick house down in the country, where he went to school. The miseries of the milk and water, and thick bread and scrapings, fading into nothing before the pleasant recollection of the green field the boys used to play in, and the green pond he was caned for presuming to fall into, and other schoolboy associations. Cabs, with trunks and bandboxes between the driver's legs and outside the apron, rattle briskly up and down the streets on their way to the coach offices or steam packet wharfs, and the cab drivers and hackney coachmen, who are on the stand, polish up the ornamental part of their dingy vehicles, the former wondering how people can prefer the wild beast caravans of omnibuses to a regular cab with a fast trotter, and the latter admiring how people can trust their necks into one of them crazy cabs, when they can have a spectable acne couch with a pair of horses as won't want to ray with no one. 
a consolation unquestionably founded on fact, seeing that a hackney coach horse never was known to run at all. Except, as the smart cabman in the front of the rank observes, except one, and he run backwards. The shops are now completely opened, and apprentices and shopmen are busily engaged in cleaning and decking the windows for the day. The baker's shops in town are filled with servants and children waiting for the drawing of the first batch of rolls, an operation which was performed a full hour ago in the suburbs, for the early clerk population of Summers and Camden Town, Islington and Pittenville, are fast pouring into the city, or directing their steps towards Chancery Lane and the Inns of Courts. Middle-aged men, whose salaries have by no means increased in the same proportion as their families, plod steadily along, apparently with no object in view but the counting house, knowing by sight almost everybody they meet or overtake, for they have seen them every morning, Sunday excepted, during the last twenty years, but speaking to no one. If they do happen to overtake a personal acquaintance, they just exchange a hurried salutation and keep walking on either by his side or in front of him, as his rate of walking may chance to be. As to stopping to shake hands, or to take the friend's arm, they seem to think that as it is not included in their salary, they have no right to do it. Small office lads in large hats, who are made men before they are boys, hurry along in pairs, with their first coat carefully brushed, and the white trousers of last Sunday plentifully besmeared with dust and ink. It evidently requires a considerable mental struggle to avoid investing part of the day's dinner money in the purchase of the stale tarts so temptingly exposed in dusty tins at the pastry cook's doors. But a conscientiousness of their own importance, and the receipt of seven shillings a week, with the prospect of an early rise to eight, comes to their aid, and they accordingly put their hats a little more on one side, and look under the bonnets of all the milliners and staymakers' apprentices they meet. Poor girls. The hardest worked, the worst paid, and too often, the worst used class of the community. Eleven o'clock, and a new set of people fill the streets. The goods in the shop windows are invitingly arranged. The shopmen in their white neckerchiefs and spruce coats look as if they couldn't clean a window if their lives depended on it. The carts have disappeared from Convent Garden, the wagoners have returned, and the costermongers repaired to their ordinary beats in the suburbs. Clerks are at their offices, and gigs, cabs, omnibuses, and saddle horses are conveying their masters to the same destination. The streets are thronged with a vast concourse of people, gay and shabby, rich and poor, idle and industrious, and we come to the heat, bustle, and activity of noon. Chapter 2. The Streets, Night. But the streets of London, to be beheld in the very height of their glory, should be seen on a dark, dull, murky winter's night, when there is just enough damp gently stealing down to make the pavement greasy without cleansing it of any of its impurities, and when the heavy, lazy mist which hangs over every object makes the gas lamps look brighter and the brilliantly lighted shops more splendid from the contrast they present to the darkness around. All the people who are at home on such a night as this seem disposed to make themselves as snug and comfortable as possible, and the passengers in the streets have excellent reason to envy the fortunate individuals who are seated by their own firesides. In the larger and better kind of streets, dining parlor curtains are closely drawn, kitchen fires blaze brightly up, and savory steams of hot dinners salute the nostrils of the hungry wayfarer as he plods warily by the area railings. In the suburbs, the muffin boy rings his way down the little street much more slowly than he is wont to do, for Mrs. Macklin of number four has no sooner opened her little street door and screamed out, Muffins! with all her might, then Mrs. Walker, at number five, puts her head out of the parlor window and screams, My fans! too, and Mrs. Walker has scarcely got the words out of her lips, then Mrs. Peplow, over the way, lets loose Master Peplow, who darts down the street with a velocity which nothing but buttered muffins in perspective could possibly inspire, and drags the boy back by main force, 
whereupon Mrs. Macklin and Mrs. Walker, just to save the boy trouble, and to say a few neighborly words to Mrs. Peplow at the same time, run over the way and buy their muffins at Mrs. Peplow's door, when it appears from the voluntary statement of Mrs. Walker that her kettle's just a bilin and the cups and sarcers ready laid, and that, as it was such a wretched night out of doors, she made up her mind to have a nice, hot, comfortable cup of tea, a determination at which, by the most singular coincidence, the other two ladies had simultaneously arrived. After a little conversation about the wretchedness of the weather and the merits of tea, with a digression relative to the viciousness of boys as a rule, and the amiability of Master Peplow as an exception, Mrs. Walker sees her husband coming down the street, and as he must want his tea, poor man, after his dirty walk from the docks, she instantly runs across, muffins in hand, and Mrs. Macklin does the same, and after a few words to Mrs. Walker, they all pop into their little houses and slam their little street doors, which are not opened again, for the remainder of the evening, except to the nine o'clock beer, who comes round with the lantern in front of his tray, and says, as he lends Mrs. Walker, yesterday's tizer, that he's blessed if he can hardly owe the pot, much less feel the paper, for it's one of the bitterest nights he ever felt, except the night when the man was frozen to death in the brickfield. After a little prophetic conversation with the policeman at the street corner, touching a probable change in the weather and the setting in of a hard frost, the nine o'clock beer returns to his master's house and employs himself for the remainder of the evening in assiduously stirring the taproom fire and deferentially taking part in the conversation of the worthies assembled round it. The streets in the vicinity of the Marsh Gate and Victoria Theatre present an appearance of dirt and discomfort on such a night, which the groups who lounge about them in no degree tend to diminish. Even the little block tin temple sacred to baked potatoes, surmounted by a splendid design in variegated lamps, looks less gay than usual, and as to the kidney pie stand, its glory has quite departed. The candle in the transparent lamp, manufactured of oil paper, embellished with characters, has been blown out fifty times. So the kidney pie merchant, tired with running backwards and forwards to the next wine vaults to get a light, has given up the idea of illumination in despair, and the only signs of his whereabout are the bright sparks of which a long, irregular train is whirled down the street every time he opens his portable oven to hand a hot kidney pie to a customer. Flatfish, oyster, and fruit vendors linger hopelessly in the kennel, in vain endeavoring to attract customers. And the ragged boys who usually disport themselves about the streets stand crouched in little knots in some projecting doorway or under the canvas blind of a cheesemonger's where great flaring gaslights, unshaded by any glass, display huge piles of bright red and pale yellow cheeses mingled with little five-penny dabs of dingy bacon, various tubs of weekly dorset, and cloudy rolls of best fresh. Here they amuse themselves with theatrical converse, arising out of their last half-price visit to the Victoria Gallery, admire the terrific combat, which is nightly encored, and expatiate on the inimitable manner in which Bill Thompson can come the double monkey, or go through the mysterious involutions of a sailor's hornpipe. It is nearly eleven o'clock, and the cold, thin rain which has been drizzling so long is beginning to pour down in good earnest. The baked potato man has departed. The kidney pie man has just walked away with his warehouse on his arm. The cheesemonger has drawn in his blind, and the boys have dispersed. The constant clicking of pattens on the slippy and uneven pavement, and the rustling of the umbrellas, as the wind blows against the shop windows, bear testimony to the inclemency of the night. And the policeman, with his oilskin cape buttoned closely round him, seems as he holds his hat on his head, and turns round to avoid the gust of wind and rain which drives against him at the street corner, to be very far from congratulating himself on the prospect before him. The little Chandler's shop with the cracked bell behind the door, whose melancholy tinkling has been regulated by the demand for quartons of sugar and half ounces of coffee, is shutting up. The crowds which have been passing to and fro during the whole day are rapidly dwindling away, and the noise of shouting and quarreling which issues from the public houses is almost the only sound that breaks the melancholy stillness of the night. There was another, 
but it has ceased. That wretched woman with the infant in her arms, round whose meager form the remnant of her own scanty shawl is carefully wrapped, has been attempting to sing some popular ballad in the hope of wringing a few pence from the compassionate passerby. A brutal laugh at her weak voice is all she has gained. The tears fall thick and fast down her own pale face. The child is cold and hungry, and its low, half-stifled wailing adds to the misery of its wretched mother as she moans aloud and sinks despairingly down on a cold, damp doorstep. Singing! How few of those who pass such a miserable creature as this think of the anguish of heart, the sinking of the soul and spirit, which the very effort of singing produces. Bitter mockery. Disease, neglect, and starvation, faintly articulating the words of the joyous ditty that has enlivened your hours of feasting and merriment, God knows how often. It is no subject of jeering. The weak, tremulous voice tells a fearful tale of want and famishing, and the feeble singer of this roaring song may turn away only to die of cold and hunger. One o'clock. Parties returning from the different theaters foot it through the muddy streets. Cabs, hackney coaches, carriages, and theater omnibuses roll swiftly by. Watermen with dim, dirty lanterns in their hands and large brass plates upon their breasts, who have been shouting and rushing about for the last two hours, retire to their watering houses to solace themselves with the creature comforts of pipes and pearl. The half-price pit and box frequenters of the theaters throng to the different houses of refreshment in chops, kidneys, rabbits, oysters, stout, cigars, and goes innumerable are served up amidst a noise and confusion of smoking, running, knife clattering, and waiter chattering perfectly indescribable. The more musical portion of the playgun community betake themselves to some harmonic meeting. As a matter of curiosity, let us follow them thither for a few moments. In a lofty room of spacious dimensions are seated some eighty or a hundred guests, knocking little pewter measures on the tables and hammering away with the handle of their knives as if they were so many trunk makers. They are applauding a glee, which has just been executed by the three professional gentlemen at the top of the center table, one of whom is in the chair, the little pompous man with the bald head just emerging from the collar of his green coat. The others are seated on either side of him, the stout man with the small voice and the thin-faced dark man in black. The little man in the chair is a most amusing personage, such condescending grandeur, and such a voice. Bass, as the young gentleman near us with the blue stock forcibly remarks to his companion, Bass, I believe you, he can go down lower than any man, so low sometimes that you can't hear him. And so he does. To hear him growling away, gradually lower and lower down, till he can't get back again, is the most delightful thing in the world. And it is quite impossible to witness unmoved the impressive solemnity with which he pours forth his soul in My Arts in the Islands, or The Brave Old Hawk. The stout man is also addicted to sentimentality, and warbles, Fly, fly from the world, my Bessie with me or some such song with ladylike sweetness and in the most seductive tones imaginable. Pray give your orders, gentlemen, pray give your orders, says the pale-faced man with the red head and demands for goes of gin and goes of brandy and pints of stout and cigars of peculiar mildness are vociferously made from all parts of the room. The professional gentlemen are in the very height of their glory and bestow condescending nods or even a word or two of recognition on the better-known frequenters of the room, in the most bland and patronizing manner possible. The little round-faced man, with the small brown surtout, white stockings and shoes, is in the comic line. The mixed air of self-denial and mental consciousness of his own powers, with which he acknowledges the call of the chair, is particularly gratifying. Gentlemen! says the little pompous man, accompanying the word with a knock of the president's hammer on the table. Gentlemen, allow me to claim your attention. Our friend, Mr. Smuggins, will oblige. Bravo, shout the company. And Smuggins, after a considerable quantity of coughing by way of symphony, and a most facetious sniff or two, which afford general delight, 
sings a comic song with a follow de roll told de roll chorus at the end of every verse, much longer than the verse itself. It is received with unbounded applause, and after some aspiring genius has volunteered a recitation and failed dismally therein, the little pompous man gives another knock and says, Gentlemen, we will attempt to glay if you please. This announcement calls forth tumultuous applause, and the more energetic spirits express the unqualified approbation it affords them by knocking one or two stout glasses off their legs, a humorous device, but one which frequently occasions some slight altercation when the form of paying the damage is proposed to be gone through by the waiter. Scenes like these are continued until three or four o'clock in the morning, and even when they close, fresh ones open to the inquisitive novice. But as a description of all of them, however slight, would require a volume, the contents of which, however instructive, would be by no means pleasing, we make our bow and drop the curtain. <laughs>